and welcome back to Oddtober, the review series where we take a look at all things Oddworld. You actually joined me for the last week in the current Oddtober season, and what better way is there than to wrap things up by taking a look at the latest game released in the series, with Oddworld new and tasty. Of course, Oddworld Soulstorm will probably be coming out relatively soon, and then this won't be the last game released in the series, but until that happens, this is the newest one. So with New and Tasty being a remake of Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, which happens to be one of my favourite games ever made, how does this compare to that original masterpiece? Well, let's pop it in and take a look. So, as I just said, Oddworld New and Tasty is a remake of the PS1 classic, Oddworld Abe's Odyssey. This means that Oddworld inhabitants were a bit ahead of the curve here, with New and Tasty coming out in 2014, way before other PS1 remakes like Resident Evil 2, Final Fantasy VII Remake, the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, or the Spyro Reignited Trilogy. I suppose technically the GameCube remakes of Resident Evil 1 and Metal Gear Solid were before New and Tasty, but in terms of 8th gen remakes, New and Tasty was one of the first PS1 era ones we saw. Rather than Oddworld inhabitants themselves developing New and Tasty, they instead acted as publishers, with a small indie team called Just Add Water being the primary developers. It might seem weird handing over the reins of such an ambitious project to another developer, but Just Add Water had already proven themselves by having previously remastered Munch's Odyssey and Stranger's Wrath for the PS3 and PS Vita. But this is very different to simply remastering a pre-existing game, because for New and Tasty, they were tasked with completely rebuilding the game. Not only making it look better, but breathing new life into it by introducing new mechanics and changing elements of the gameplay. With New and Tasty fundamentally being the same game as Abe's Odyssey, I'm going to spare going into too much detail about the core gameplay, and instead focus on the differences between the two versions. If you do want a more in-depth breakdown, then you can check out my lengthy video that I did on the original Abe's Odyssey, which I'll link in the description below. Most of the things I say in that video do still apply to New and Tasty, but with a few notable caveats that we'll talk about now. So let's start by taking a look at the graphics. As well as the game now being HD and featuring 3D models and backgrounds, rather than 2D sprites and painted backgrounds, it also has a dynamic camera that follows Abe, rather than scrolling from screen to screen like the original did. This not only makes New and Tasty look and feel much more modern, but it also means that elements of the gameplay had to be changed due to some puzzles and sections of the original game relying on the screen scrolling from one to another. Most of the time this is quite minimal stuff, like chance suppressors becoming active when you're a certain distance away from them, and sligs going back to sleep if you wait a while after waking them up. It's great that they adjusted several gameplay elements to compensate for the new camera system though, and it means that the puzzle design from the original game is left mostly intact. The big point of contention with the graphics is how dramatically different the visual style is from the original game. In the original, the cutscenes and the gameplay itself wasn't the highest quality, and elements had to be compressed to work on PS1 hardware. This compression actually works to the game's advantage in my opinion though, making everything look slightly grainy and dirty, which is fitting for the setting of Rupture Farms and the wastelands that you explore later in the game. This combined with the already dark and grimy industrial setting gives the game an incredibly distinct identity. Meanwhile, New and Tasty features much sharper graphics, obviously no longer being heavily compressed due to being on modern hardware. But as well as that, the actual visual design has been altered to be much brighter, with colourful neon signs everywhere, and everything looking much, for lack of a better word, cleaner. The animations in cutscenes are much more childlike and cartoony too, and it's clear that the humour the series is known for is much more at the forefront of the experience here. This is amplified not only by the animations, but also by things like the Madokans chatting to each other while working, and other elements like this. I hate 
need to smell. <sighs> Climb that janitorial ladder. Hello. Uh, spray time Hello, Follow me. Okay. Now, whether you prefer the darker style of the original game or this new, more light-hearted vibe of the remake is entirely subjective, and I actually think this key difference between the two games is an important one because it means that the remake doesn't outright replace the original because of how different the tones are. I personally much prefer the darker style of Abe's Odyssey, but I found the remake more interesting to play because it didn't replicate this. One aspect of the game's visuals I really didn't like was how there's adverts for other games that you can buy in reality placed within the universe of Oddworld. This just felt really cheap and tacky and breaks immersion completely when you see them. It's not just a one-off example either, this happened quite a few times and I really didn't appreciate it. Obviously this isn't a big issue and a lot of people probably wouldn't even notice it, but it just felt a bit icky. But anyway, now let's talk about the differences with the gameplay. For the vast majority of the game, the level design here is almost identical to the original. There's a few minor changes made to certain puzzles and a couple of added sections where you do platforming while riding Elam, but really 95% of the game is identical to the original. Despite the level design being the same though, there's several key differences with abilities you have access to which change how you experience the game completely. Firstly, they took the quick save mechanic from Abe's Exodus and implemented it into Abe's Odyssey. This is a fantastic change to make the game more accessible and less frustrating, but I found that it almost broke the game by making it far too easy. You can quick save at the tap of a button and then load back to that point by holding the button. It's actually pretty impressive how instantaneous this is. There's literally no loading and it just snaps back to whatever point you last saved at. There is a frame drop whenever you quick save or hit a checkpoint, which is a little bit annoying, but this is just a minor issue really. The greater issue with this is that you can just save whenever you want and then when you die or mess up, there's no penalty for returning to that save point. This removes any effect of dying and basically means you're able to brute force every single section of the game by constantly saving and loading to earlier points. The argument I know some people will make is that you could just choose not to quick save, but when it's this easy to do and there's no real reason to not do it, it's just too tempting to use it. Even if I did simply not use the quick saves though, the actual checkpoints provided by the game itself are much more frequent than in the original game, which again makes it a lot more forgiving but takes away from any real repercussion for failing. It's kind of a situation where I'm left thinking maybe they should have had either more checkpoints or quick saving, but not both. Plus, maybe there could have been a harder difficulty which removed quick saving completely, or maybe the game should have rewarded players for not using the quick save, or gave you a limit on the amount of quick saves you can use in an area. Any of these options for making the quick save a bit less powerful would have made the game a little bit better to experience. In the original game, you felt constantly on edge, scared of what might be on the next screen, because if you die, you actually have something to lose. It made the game a much slower paced experience where every action you took had weight to it and meant something. But in New and Tasty, not only can you always see what's ahead of you thanks to the new camera system, which removes any sense of mystery, but it doesn't matter if you mess up anyway, because you can just return to the moment before you died and rectify your mistake. None of your actions matter and you feel ridiculously overpowered because you're basically an invincible god with the ability to reverse time, a far cry from how underpowered and threatened you felt in the original game. I'm still confused as to whether Elam is supposed to be the name of a species or if it's the name of an individual character. All of the games seem to go back and forth on this, and since 1998, this has driven me insane. Even in the remake, this sentence here implies that Elam is the name of a specific character. Elam likes honey but hates bees, so it has to be its name, right? 
But then there's also posters advertising Elam chubs, and this text here that says, Out of the forest, the Elam appeared. So what the hell is going on? The sentence from before should read either, Elam like honey but hate bees, or maybe even Elams like honey but hate bees, depending on the plural term for multiple Elam. But no, it says Elam likes honey but hates bees, which makes no grammatical sense unless Elam is the creature's name instead of its species. The only logical conclusion I can come to about this is that Elam is the species name, but it's also the name of this particular Elam. That is stupid, but it's the only thing that makes sense. Don't get me wrong though, not every change made in New and Tasty is bad. Outside of gameplay changes, we have a ton of accessibility features, like subtitles, audio balancing, difficulty selection which gives you more health on the easier difficulties, and controller customization. This is all great and allows people of different skill levels, and with different needs, to experience the game how they want. The controller customization is a particularly good feature, because by default, the controls are actually a bit lame, and not to my taste. The way it works is that by moving the left stick slightly, you'll walk, but then fully tilting it will make you run. But the issue with this is that for the vast majority of the game, you're gonna be wanting to walk, because otherwise, you'll move too fast and constantly run into bombs and enemies. So with the default control scheme, you're expected to basically never fully tilt the left stick, which leaves you awkwardly always half tilting it. The default jumping is also a little bit weird. By pressing the jump button, you'll jump up into the air, but then pressing jump and moving the analog stick will make you hop. It just feels a little bit unprecise, and like you would perform the wrong type of jump all the time, resulting in Abe's death. But the important thing here is that you can completely change this and make it feel identical to the original, with the left stick making you walk and you having to hold another button to run, and making the jump button do a hop forward and then pressing up, making you jump in the air. This probably should have been the default control scheme, to be honest, but I get they were wanting to make it feel more modern. Either way, my point is, the accessibility options here are really good. In terms of gameplay changes beyond the quicksave mechanic, there's been a few things that have been tweaked. Throw in objects like grenades, rocks and meat is now done by using the right analogue stick to aim, and then being able to freely throw the object wherever you want, rather than being kinda limited as to where you can throw stuff like in the original. You can also choose to drop an object by just tapping the throw button, but to be honest, this comes in handy like twice in the whole game. Don't get me wrong, it's nice to have, but it's very underutilised. And speaking of underutilised, you also have the ability to crouch sneak now, as well as throw an unlimited supply of bottle caps. This crouch sneaking is only used a couple of times in the entire game, and the bottle cap throwing I literally didn't even use a single time. I think this is supposed to be used to create distractions and wake up sleeping enemies, but there's literally no reason to ever do this, so this was a bit of a strange addition to the game. Another change is that you can now say hello and follow me to multiple Madokans rather than having them follow you one at a time, like in the original. Not only that, but Madokans will also instantly follow you off of ledges rather than having to say follow me again to get them to drop. These changes are amazing and I do wish that these elements were in the original, to be honest. What justifies having these new abilities even more than that is that instead of rescuing 99 Madokans like in the original game, you instead have to rescue 299 Madokans. That's 200 more than in the original game. That's a hell of a lot more content, right? Well, no. Despite having 200 more Madokans, they're mostly all placed in the exact same areas that the original 99 were anyway. I noticed two areas where there previously weren't any Madokans, one being here at the start of the game where you have to take this train to reach a dead end, and another time here in the final sections of the game where there's a secret area that doesn't exist in the original. 
Other than that, the placements are identical, so I guess they just added more Madokans to make it feel more satisfying to rescue them? It would have been great to have seen brand new secret areas, but this was a bit of a missed opportunity. While the game does take several elements from Abe's Exodus, there are a couple of things introduced in that game that I feel like they should have brought over into New and Tasty that for some reason they didn't. For example, the more detailed Madokan tally charts that state how many Madokans are in the specific area you're on are nowhere to be seen. And another thing I think they should have taken from Abe's Exodus is how that game subtly placed objects around the areas where you enter secret passages. Because the level design here is the same as in Abe's Odyssey, some of these secret areas are straight up ridiculous to find if you're brand new to the game, and the only reason I was able to find them all is because I already know where everything is from the original game. Abe's Exodus did a good job at fixing this issue by placing Soulstorm brew bottles around the entrances to these areas, but here, there's nothing to imply that there's a secret, which is a little bit annoying. Add to this how easy it is to miss Madokans due to the not being a detailed tally chart, and it could be irritating to have missed stuff even when you're being thorough. One amazing element to the game that does actually fix this issue though is that once you've finished an area, you can actually go back to the main menu and level select to revisit previous areas of the game. You can see a Madokan rescue percentage here too, and you can effectively get 100% completion without having to replay the entire game all over again. While I really do appreciate this, and again, it's another thing that I wish would have been put into the original game, I do think that this backtracking element could have potentially been handled in a better way, which doesn't require the use of quitting the game to access a menu. I mentioned this all the way back in my Abe's Exodus review, but wouldn't it have been cool to have had the game designed almost like a Metroidvania, where you're able to backtrack to previous areas anytime you want, within the game itself? Obviously the design of the levels would need to be heavily modified to compensate for this, but it would have been possible. Maybe with Oddworld Soulstorm, we might get something like this, but I doubt it. I think the best way of summing this whole thing up is that it's a very good game, but it's let down by a few flaws that stop it from becoming the definitive version of Abe's Odyssey. Saying that is subjective though, because some of the aspects about New and Tasty that I don't like, some other people would probably prefer to the way the original game handled things. The quick save, for example, I think is overpowered and makes the game a little bit too easy but another player might appreciate this change because it makes the game more accessible to them. For me though, Abe's Odyssey is the better overall game. New and Tasty is still good though, and it has the advantage of being available on more modern hardware, making it more accessible to a lot of players, so if you haven't already played it, I would definitely recommend you give it a go. I'm putting Oddworld New and Tasty in fourth place in my series ranking. It's actually kinda close between this and Stranger's Wrath, but with that being a fully original game that has more scope and ambition put into it than this, I feel like it deserves to be placed higher. New and Tasty is a weird one because it does actually fix a ton of the issues I had with the original game. The checkpoints are more forgiving, you can talk to more than one Madokan at a time and they'll follow you off of ledges. There's a level select option, making getting the Madokans a lot easier and allowing you to effectively backtrack through the game. And there's several quality of life improvements, some of which I've not even mentioned. Like how the native Madokans that give you spirit rings don't require a whistle password every single time you need the power up, and rather, after completing the password one time, they'll automatically give it to you from then on. The cutscene viewer now being accessible on the main menu is another amazing quality of life change too. So why then don't I like New and Tasty as much as the original Abe's Odyssey? It literally comes down to my preference for the difficulty of the original game, giving you a much greater punishment for dying, and the overall tone of the original being a lot darker. Abe's Odyssey, in my opinion, also looks a lot better due to the sheer amount of style and the far superior cinematography featured in that game. 
I also much prefer the controls in the original, with them being more weighty and requiring a bit more precision from the player. That isn't to say though that New and Tasty is outright worse than Abe's Odyssey. I would say that if I were to look at this completely objectively and remove any bias from my personal preferences, the games are probably just as good as each other, but for very different reasons. New and Tasty is much more accessible and features more modern design philosophies, but there's something a bit more engaging about the fact that Abe's Odyssey is rougher around the edges and requires more effort from the player to get through. It's weird how the games feel so different, despite featuring almost identical level design. It just goes to show how much the core of a game can be affected by all of these outside elements. The great thing about these differences though is that it means that both New and Tasty and Abe's Odyssey are still worth playing to this day. A lot of remakes try to completely replace the original by attempting to keep the experience incredibly similar but simply adding new graphics. While these types of remakes can be good, I often find them boring, because if you want to play the game in its original state, you can already do that. What justifies a remake is when the developers change aspects of the game, such as the level design, the visual identity, fix some of the flaws, or if they add a boatload of additional content to that initial experience. New and Tasty may feature the same story and levels that we all know from the original, but the developers changed the controls, visual style, and added in enough modern features to make this a good remake even if, in my opinion, it doesn't surpass the original. I mean, there's some stuff I've not even mentioned, like the online leaderboards, which promote speedrunning the game, which actually adds a lot of replay value. It is a shame, though, that there's no completion reward. There's not even a music player like in Muncher's Odyssey for the Game Boy Advance. An obvious route that could have gone down with this is allowing you to unlock different cosmetics for Abe, depending on what criteria you meet. There is actually a single skin that you can get in New and Tasty, but it's locked behind a microtransaction and isn't unlockable in the game itself, which is a bit of a shame. So to sum it up, while most of the changes made in New and Tasty I actually don't like as much as what was already present in the original, I would rather it be that way than just having a remake that sticks too close to the original and as a result becomes unnecessary. And that's Oddworld New and Tasty, and with that not only have we wrapped up the second season of Oddtober, but we've also reviewed every single game released in the Oddworld series so far. One last thing that I'll say about New and Tasty is that there's a really weird song that plays over the end credits. You might even say, it's a bit odd. Anyway, let me know down in the comments below if you would like to see a third season of Oddtober next year, because I do have a couple of ideas about the direction I could take that in. Obviously now we've already reviewed all of the games in the entire series, so we'd be having to move away from that and doing more discussion-based videos instead. Like, one of the things we could talk about are the bad endings of the Oddworld games, and we could also delve into some of the cancelled Oddworld projects as well. If that sounds interesting to you, definitely let me know, and I'll see what I can do. Also let me know down in the comments if you've recently picked up New and Tasty for the Switch, and what you're thinking about it so far. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe to see more stuff like this coming soon, and until the next video, bye!